And the first talk is by Ron Przybylinski, and he has a very long title. Do you want me to read it all? I'll read maybe the first half. A Brief Overview of the History of Convective Lines and Bow Echoes from the 1950s to Now. And take it away. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, people are asking me, how am I going to cover this topic in 15 minutes? So am I going to create some kind of magic for everyone basically here, you know? From 1950 to now, it's impossible to do. So I'm just going to hit some of the highlights uh, of the uh, work. I came to Weather Service back in 1979. And back at that time, we just had conventional radar, no Doppler radar. We didn't have any mesoscale models. We, it was very primitive back then. And uh, we had the old teletype here, basically. So I kind of went through a whole evolution from the, the late 1970s to the current time right now with AWIPS and AWIPS 2 and so forth. So it's quite interesting. We're going to focus our attention, and I'm going to get just hit mainly the highlights here, um, like I say, of the uh, overview of the uh, convective lines and bow echoes from the 50s to now. I want to thank very much uh, Steve Weiss here from the Stern Prediction Center, helping me out quite a bit. Angie Lisi, she's a sewer down in Nashville, Tennessee, as well, help, as, well as helping me out in this particular presentation. Um, this was very common, uh, just seeing basically the early stages uh, of line echo wave pattern from Nolan and from Tepper from 1950s to 1959. The education training weather service back in the late 70s was very, very primitive. If you want to look at uh, the radar course, for example, was 99% mechanics of the radar and 1% meteorology or the science. So you can tell it was really just knowing more about the mechanics of the radar and so forth. And very little science infusion was ever done back at that particular time. So, And one of the first projects that uh, occurred along with the work done at Nora, Oklahoma on the supercell uh, was a project done by Dr. Fujita back in the late, uh, mid to late 1970s here. This was called the Northern Illinois Meteorological Research in Donburs, Nimrod Project. And uh, this kind of shows you a nice overview of the uh, network they had. They had two they had NCARS. CP3 and CP4 Doppler radars. That was the five centimeters at that time. They had several PAM stations out, the mesonet PAM stations. And then, like I say, um, they also had the chill Doppler radar from the Illinois State Water Survey. Uh, they were able to capture a number of cases, and this is one of the cases they captured was back on uh, June 25th, 1978 here, particularly showing the blue echo and also showing, like I say, the wind flow associated with the Doppler radar pattern and so forth. Uh, and a lot of good work came out of this project. Uh, this is the first groundbreaking of convective lines and bow echoes uh, that uh, came out uh, you know, from the research community. And Dr. Fujita was able to go ahead and with his number of cases, able to develop a conceptual model of the bow echo. And I think you've seen his image so many times in the past. I won't go into great detail at this point. Uh, also at this time, Roger, uh, Dr. Fujita, as well as Dr. Wakimoto, Roger Wakimoto here, uh, looked at, uh, again, the actual aerial surveys of uh, the MG winds, and they went from what was called the family of downburst clusters all the way down to burst swaths. And I can appreciate the work they have done because I've looked at a number of cases. For example, the May 12 super derecho that went across southern Missouri, uh, and now I know what deforestation is like. It's just incredible. This may be one tree here, one tree there, and that's it. All these trees are just laid down and deforested quite a bit and so forth. So, but uh, they did basically scale analysis showing the various types of, you know, we go from the downburst uh, cluster all the way down through downburst microburst as well as the burst swath and through the scales here and so forth. Uh, I did some work back in the early 1980s, around 1982, uh, to 1985, and one of my forecasters, at Indianapolis, I was at the Indianapolis office at this time, and we just looked at conventional reflectivity data. And what could we glean out of the reflectivity patterns? At home, I, got, I have a numerous tracing paper of radar reflectivity I've done. This was very hard work at that particular time, but, but I've got, I think it was about 25 cases, a very limited amount of cases, but we were trying to outline the reflectivity patterns here that kind of showed up. And uh, the guy here on the uh, uh, located here uh, will also solve some kind of at least a surface frontal boundary, maybe, or a quasi stationary frontal boundary extending to the east northeast uh, of this particular Boeing structure. Um, 
We also had the HP supercell concept here, basically, where an HP supercell uh, would evolve into uh, a Bo Echo. I did spend some time working with uh, uh, with Al Moeller, and uh, we shared traces of just reflectivity data. Again, no Doppler velocity data, just reflectivity traces, looking at the reflectivity patterns, and what can we glean as where the damage and winds were occurring. We would go out do uh, damage surveys, and my boss was very, he was very happy. Uh, he, was, he would just say, Ron, go out, and I would take a forecaster with me, and we would go out, conduct detailed damage surveys ac uh, across much of central and north central Indiana and also into south central Indiana. Northern portion of Indiana was pretty flat terrain, so we were able to capture a lot of cases across the central and northern part of the state. Uh, also at this time, mid-1980s, uh, a major uh, project called the Pre-Storm Project evolved, and this is where they had also, again, the CP3, CP4 Doppler radars from NCAR that was positioned east and west of Wichita, Kansas. This was a high plains experiment that occurred. And this is an example of the June 10, 1985. The goal of this project was to look at and to identify what kind of airflow structures that we had in the MCS system. And you can see particular like say, our descending. Uh, this work was done by Bob Howes. Uh, Mike Bigger's staff, uh, Brad Small. But you can see the descending mesoscale rainflow jet at that time, and then also the ascending branch, like say, uh, kind of from the convective towers, and like say, ascending to the rear of the convective system. You see a nice, a nice multi cell evolution going on, only leading edge and then the hand strata form precept region. And uh, again, this was a, just a famous conceptual model. There were big plans at that time, back in the mid-1980s, asking Congress for lots of money to develop a storm project. It never materialized. The money just never came. And so we just, it was very fortunate that the, uh, all the, Dr. House and, and Brad and Mike and other people had a chance to go ahead and at least conduct one uh, that, that uh, spring summer of 1985 and, and also looked at several MCSs across the central plains here. Uh, Bob Johns, uh, retired SBC forecaster, and Bill Hurt. You've seen his paper. Uh, not many people probably know about this paper. And uh, through uh, radar summary charts, Bob Johns and Bill would look at the damage patterns, all the local storm reports coming in, and compare the radar uh, summary charts to what the damage patterns look like. And what they, in, in a large scale, they did not use radar. They might use some radar, but most of it was in a large scale with the radar summary charts off the facsimile machines. Remember, this is archaic. This is you know, way back in the 80s. And, and computers were, you know, the first 8088 machine, IBM machine, didn't come into the weather service until about 1988. So we're talking about quite some time that we were just, you know, we were just in the um, dark ages, you want to call it, basically. So... But uh, they uh, they show basically a nice you know, where some of the where the nice swath uh, the greatest uh, durations would be forming over the northern plains here, and traveling east southeastward towards Pennsylvania and Virginia, and the radar summary charts indicate a progressive pattern along a quasi station from the boundary, along the north of the boundary where the actual system would move across in the boundary, and then we have the progressive pattern to the south here. And then comes Morris Wiseman's work. I gotta give Morris a lot of credit for his work, starting in the early, early 1990s here, showing the, through his numerical simulations the three stages of the evolution of convective systems, where we have in uh, stage one here the ambient shear dominance, while in the stage two ambient shear and convective system co put were in balance. And we've noticed this over the years that when this system is in balance, this is where we find our best chance for tornadogenesis to occur. So we're looking at convectively upright convection, essentially. And then at the Kopu system uh, evolves with time here, and the Kopu dominates, and then the actual uh, convective system somewhat tilts upright, uh, up shear, basically, to the west and southwest here. And this is one of Morris's uh, early uh, modeling of the, uh, of the bow echo that evolved here, and I'm just going to kind of show you just a quick uh, example how we see several Boeing segments in this particular simulation that he worked on back in 1993 here. This was great work at this time and gave a lot of us in the operational community appreciation what Boeing, you know, uh, how the Boeing would be evolving and so forth. 
And then I uh, worked with Gary Schmolker at the at St. Louis office, and we, we kind of know some of a, a what's called a mark structure, a, um, a mid-altitude real convergence signature. We found a very intense in, uh, uh, outbound adjacent to a very intense inbound within six, seven kilometers. And we noticed that uh, when these values reach 50, not, 50 knots or greater, or 25 meters per second or greater, we came. Uh, we found. We often found that there was damage winds occurring uh, during the next, you know, five, ten, fifteen minutes, and so forth. So this is more of an operational tool, and a lot of people still use this tool. It's amazing. I, you know, Gary and I just got involved in other projects and so forth. But we want to still go back to this project if we get the opportunity. So, and then throughout the early uh, late nineties, early two thousands, many people were involved and doing uh, individual cases and also composites of, uh, of actually line, line convection. And this is some of the work, uh, Don Burgess and Brad Small. Uh, this is part of the Kananaskis uh, conference back in 1990. Matt Parker uh, also showed that linear uh, MCS archetypes that exist, a terrain stratiform, lean stratiform, and parallel stratiform precip. And uh, Klamowski, now, uh, now uh, I think he just recently retired, I believe, uh, shows the evolution across the northern plains, particularly. He did a nice climatological study across the Dakotas uh, with Mac Bunkers and so forth. And then I kept on looking. A lot, a lot, a lot of my cases I've been looking at did show some kind of use of frontal boundary or at least a quasi-station frontal boundary to the south, and this can be the focus for the initial development of uh, mesovore disease at new and south at intersection. And then we had distant Merkel simulation results from Trapp and Wiseman here back in 2003, early 2000s. And this shows where the vortex lines are basically be, are being bent downward through descending flow. And we see an anticyclonic one uh, to the north and the cyclonic one to the south. And some of the operational people will look somewhat a little bit confused here. Uh, but well, we know, uh, Nolan Atkins and myself we looked at some cases and we could, it was very difficult to find the anticyclonic vortex uh, to our north, but we, we did observe the actual uh, uh, cyclonic one. Well, it's already yellow. I'm, I'm pushing myself here a little bit. Then we had the Great Bamex project in June 2003 over a central part of the United States. We housed it at Sky Air Force Base, uh, Mid America Airport. And uh, a lot, uh, Roger was involved, uh, Morris Wiseman, Chris Davis, Dan Trier. Stan worked on MCS, uh, MCV work and so forth. While well, we looked at uh, several biological cases, one of the cases that we covered was the June 10th case of 2003. Uh, Bamex also delivered a little mesovortex dilemma where we find a lot of the mesovortices. Uh, basically, that it did occur across over, like, say, Indiana and also other parts here of the Midwest. And then here's another example of the uh, generation of lion vortices from Morris's numerical simulation work showing uh, basically downward tilting of the vortex lines, showing a cyclonic member and a cyclonic member. And then this is the upward tilting of the vortex lines through the updraft here, uh, the cyclonic member to the north and the cyclonic member to the south. And then the conceptual models evolved after the BAMEX project. Here, this is from Nolan Atkins and, and St. Laurent here. Basically, uh, the initial paper kind of showed where basically where the strongest path of damage and winds would be occurring, mainly north of the apex of the Boeco. And there are times you see two, three mesovortices, four mesovortices north of the apex there. I've come across even recent cases showing that. And uh, this is uh, Nolan's conceptual model that uh, came out in 2009, showing how the uh, vortex lines would be tilted up sheer, I mean tilted uh, upward by the uh, updraft here from the east. And uh, this is part of the actual June 10th case showing that the mesovortices, uh, like say the longer lived mesovortices would be tornado producers, while the short lived mesovortices with the, the June 10th case would be non tornadic producers, really, they didn't spawn any tornadoes. And then uh, the recent work was done by Lisi and Martin, Martinez here and just uh, Schumann and Jason Schumann from Springfield office and myself, and uh, showing the actual these large scale MCS systems, we start seeing vortices basically start tra traversing to the west and northwest, which is quite interesting here. And we found this balance between the uh, up shear and down shear right near the, this portion of the actual system here. 
And uh, what we found in this other case, I worked with the Tulsa people on May 13, 2010, that somewhat nullifies uh, Nolan's uh, idea that uh, we had some very long-lived mesovortices, yet they were non-tonatic in nature. And while some of the short-lived mesovortices were tonatic and also spawned some pretty decent damage, EF2 damage in some cases uh, near the Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is an early morning case that occurred on May 13th. Okay, almost there to the end. Uh, this is some of the latest work done by the Huntsville people. Uh, Dr. Kevin Nupp and, and his group basically showing the uh, Mullins and Nupp paper showing the actual uh, uh, MCV structure, and we see a lot of vorticity associated with the tornadoes that moved to the northeast. And this was the, this was the first of the three events that occurred uh, on the uh, April 27, 2011 case. I'm not going to have time to go through the summary, but you can kind of read the summary itself. And uh, this has been a, a wonderful ride, I tell you, starting from ground zero, where we had nothing practically, and now uh, we have all this great stuff here available and so forth. So it's, uh, it, was a great, it was a great time period. Thank you very much.